Hi everyone, welcome to another YouTube recording. We're doing something different today, which is covering a significant podcast set to debut this week, or really set to begin its second season, since many of you already have heard the Signal Award-winning first season of The Long Shadow by historian and journalist Garrett Graff, which explored a series of enduring sort of um, mysteries and lingering questions surrounding 9-11. In his follow-up season, Long Shadow, Rise of the American Far Right, uh, Graff has assembled an eight-episode series that traces at least a sort of 30-year arc connecting January 6th to a succession of domestic terrorist attacks beginning with the tragic uh, Waco siege in 1993. The series posits and uh, provides extensive de- documentation that disparate famous episodes like Ruby Ridge, Oklahoma City, Charlottesville, and of course, the mayhem of January uh, 6th itself are in fact individual chapters in a single volume of long-standing deadly game of cat and mouse between the federal government and a uh, organic or a Uh, continuous anti-government movement. So uh, to discuss this important new historical podcast, I'm really pleased to welcome the creator of Long Shadow, Garrett Graff, uh, national security journalist and historian and current contributor to Wired and CNN. Graff is the director of the Cyber Institute at the Aspen, excuse me, of the Cyber Initiatives at the uh, Aspen Institute. He's the author of eight books even with this long-winded intro, I won't give you all of them, but it includes Raven Rock, which was a national bestseller about the government's Cold War doomsday plans, The Only Plane in the Sky, and Oral History of 9-11. That is a really riveting read. I totally recommend it. Number one national bestseller. And Watergate, A New History, an instant New York Times bestseller. So uh, we've got the guy with the goods. Um, Garrett Graff, thanks for joining us on Talking Feds. Harry, it's great to see you. Okay, so we're taping now on April 10th, two days before the 30th uh, anniversary of the Waco siege. And that's also your point of embarkation for the series. Um, Was that, in fact, as you see it, Karen, the birth of the contemporary far-right terrorist movement? Or is just a midpoint on a longer through line? Absolutely both. And, you know, this is a story that you know well from your own career and history. Um, You know, this is the 30th anniversary this month of the fiery end of that 51-day siege uh, at Waco of the Branch Davidian compound at Mount Carmel. And that that becomes this sort of set of embers that uh, I think in many ways sparks the modern far right and that what this podcast really tries to answer is this question of like how did we get here you know how did we get to the point where there are armed militia groups like the oath keepers and the proud boys and the three percenters storming the u.s capitol you know doing battle with capitol police on the steps of the u.s capitol trying to disrupt a presidential election. And the answer, I think, in many ways begins at Waco. Um, and I I went down there uh, last November as I was starting the research for this. And what stands today at the site of the uh, old Mount Carmel compound, it's still owned by the successors of the Branch Davidian sect, is a small beige memorial chapel. And what most Americans don't realize is the person who raised the money for that. The That was where Alex Jones got his start. He was wow. a... He was a local public access radio talk show host in Austin, Texas, and becomes outraged by Waco. And he ends up raising the money, uh, you know, through his radio show, through his talk radio, uh, through his uh, public access show, uh, to rebuild that 
chapel on the site of the Branch Davidian compound. And it becomes really his first national cause. And what we try to tell in this series is less the events of Waco themselves, um, which are relatively well known, um, you know, even for people who were not alive then, but the transformation of Waco from an event to a myth. And it becomes this founding myth for the far right that, uh, of course, inspires two years later the uh, the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building by Timothy McVeigh on April 19th, 1995, exactly two years after the Waco, uh, the Waco fire, and becomes this rallying point for this whole broader far-right movement. And what we try to trace through these episodes is, again, and this, you know, you you know some of the story. You've lived some of this Well, story actually, yourself. I'm going to follow up on Wicca because I, not only am old enough, I was sitting in the Attorney General's conference room for some of these 51 days. So I'm very curious about what what it wrought in addition to just the conflagration itself. But please, can, yeah. you were you were beginning to go even um, farther afield from what it, it was is that part of the challenge is that I think as a country and as a government, we sort of like to tell these stories as one-offs. You know, the the siege at Ruby Ridge was sort of one set of blunders. The siege at Waco was one set of blunders. You know, Timothy McVeigh was a lone wolf. Um, but that's not really true when you look at this over a 40-year history. And so what this series tries to do is show how there is a uniting, fundamental, foundational set of ideology that guides this far-right movement as it evolves from really the 1970s and the 1980s up through the 1990s in Oklahoma City and on into the 2000s with the rise of the Oath Keepers, the, sh the showdown at the Bundy Ranch, the takeover of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, and then the shootings at, in, Christ, in, in Charleston, in Christ Church, in, you know, the Pittsburgh Tree of Life uh, Synagogue, on up through the COVID protests of 2020, the Black Lives Matter protests, and finally culminating in January 6th. I mean, I, I think then that that as it is for many sort of small religious groups, uh, you, founding myth is a very uh, nice way to put it. And, it. and it sounds as if people come of age or they are with. Obviously, we, we knew those things uh, for the most part don't come completely out of the blue. And so what is happening behind the scenes, as it were, um, in, in advance of, of such an attack is, you know, some kind of inculcation of, uh, I guess you could say ideology in this case in Waco. Um, so very briefly, Waco, there's a, a standoff. It's not, a, it's not designed as a terrorist, uh, attack, a standoff. In fact, remind me what had the Waco folks, they, they had failed to pay any of their taxes or it, it was an ATF of... investigation yeah. into, uh, basically uh, illegally possessing and manufacturing machine guns um, and grenades, among yeah. other and, and, oh, things. So, and did, was the supposition that they were harvesting them for some kind of, um, uh, you know, terrorist attack? Um, so it, it's a little bit unclear, you know, even many years later, what the true... Uh, motives were, you know, some of it was, uh, some of it was revenue that the Branch Davidians were sort of planning to use, you know, manufacturing these weapons as uh, revenue for the sect. Um, and some of it was, you know, it was an apocalyptic set and that they really did believe that the uh, forces of Babylon, um, yeah. you know, would, would come down upon them and come down upon the earth. And that, you know, in some ways that is exactly what ended up happening. Yeah. So, and there is some intertwining of, of Christian offshoot doctrine for, for many of these. So just, so Waco it, uh, itself, you know, agonizing weeks, finally Reno gives the order. It's tragic. Many people uh, die. Does it become, so in lore, Garrett, uh, just looking forward, when when I sat 
when people sat down to teach their children about Waco, what what do they uh, teach them? Is it a, a hostile government looking to kill them, uh, including you know I'm, the Ruby Ridge folks, the, et cetera? How do they take it? You're exactly right. That that's where the the mythology around Waco is that this is a tyrannical government coming for religious people to take away their arms. Um, and sort of both of those are technically true in the context of this one event, but you know certainly not borne out by the government's actual motives there. Right. Um, but then what you begin to see is you know that fall uh the assault weapons ban comes into uh comes into force you know uh mm -hmm. you know in in no small part due to a Delaware senator named Joe Biden right and that this um you know that the the far right militia movements really do in this moment feel themselves under siege from a federal government that is coming for their arms Got it. Okay, so that that overlay abides in many of the individual instances. It's not simply uh, very right wing back to the land types. If they're really safeguarding their arms, then they and and thinking maybe in end of days terms, then at least it's part of the whole uh, mythology that uh, we have to husband our arms, and in fact, you know, we'll be using them as the uh, the last days arrive it, it, exactly and and you know again one of the people inspired that uh by that siege is, is tim mcveigh i mean one of the people uh one of the things again people don't really remember tim mcveigh came to waco he's he he was uh back from his service in the persian gulf war um you know sort of disaffected disillusioned uh, working the gun show circuit across the country, selling anti-government bumper stickers, and he ends up coming down to Waco. Um, and and we found for this podcast and interviewed um, a young student journalist, then a young student journalist um, from Southern Methodist University, who went down to do some reporting around the siege, and ends up actually interviewing Tim McVeigh as he's sitting on the trunk of his car. Uh, selling these anti-government bumper stickers on a hill overlooking the Waco compound. Um, by the time the fire happens on April 19th, he's back in uh, Michigan with Terry Nichols, who becomes his, uh, who, who is his uh, military friend, who becomes the sort of his co-conspirator for the the bombing itself. Um, and, you know, stands there watching the building burn with tears coming down his eyes and, um, and swears revenge at the beginning of that day. Um, but again, one of the things that we sort of forget that most people don't understand, April 19th is not significant, April 19th, 1995 is not only significant because it is the day of the anniversary of the Waco siege. It's also the day that the founder of one uh, of another far right group in the 1980s, who uh, was tried and imprisoned and sentenced to death by the federal government, was set to be executed. And do you know what building that uh, that group and that man in the 1980s tried to target? The Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. And so there becomes this sort of uh, story and rhyme and history layered on in these uh, events over these 40 years that most people now forget. And we sort of teach Oklahoma City as this like weird thing that Tim McVeigh yeah, did all by himself with Terry Nichols. Um, yeah, this is this is really fascinating. So let's go all the way flat, fast forward now and and talk about you know, we all saw there have been some thousand or so prosecutions growing out of January 6th. And the people in that building, there are a handful of flamboyantly, you know, antisocial characters with the horns and the tattoos, etc. But they, we've seen them in court and we saw them that day. And they don't look um, like complete social 
dropouts. They look like people with day jobs and family lives and the like. So either choosing a specific event like Ruby Ridge or just any kind of day in the life as it goes from uh, Waco to now, who are these guys? What are they doing? Where are they meeting that they're learning the lore of uh, Waco? Where, who, what, are, what, what are their children's roles? Is it all families? Do they live together? So, you know, the, the sociology of this kind of growing, uh, waxing and waning group, I think. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things we really try to do in this series is put the far right in a historical perspective. That this really is a group and an ideology that traces its roots back to the Ku Klux Klan. And it is, um, you know, there is this underpinning of white supremacy. White Great, that self-consciously traces its roots. I mean, this, these are yes. the grand granddaddies were the guys in, yes. the, in the robes. We love those guys. Yeah. Okay, sorry, go ahead. And that this, and that there is a sort of this underpinning and continuous thread of white supremacy and white nationalism that sort of follows these groups through these movements over 40 years, in part because what the white power movement realizes in the 1990s is it, it's a lot more popular for them to sort of downplay their white power roots and to sort of play up the patriotic militia side of their work. Um, and so one of the main characters, if you want to call it that, of the second half of the series um, ends up becoming Stuart Rhodes. Um, of course, the, um, the Oath Keeper founder who, um, you know, ends up going on trial for seditious conspiracy um, in his role in the January 6th um, uh, insurrection. Um, and, and sort of looking at how the Oath Keepers come to become such a key part of this movement. Um, and, and it, you know, the whole story is in some ways also this tension between the US government and these groups and trying to figure out how, how to investigate these groups and target these groups. And the, you know, again, in episode you probably remember very well, um, DHS in 2009 becomes very concerned about the potential radicalization of uh, 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 of returning Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans um, and sort of their susceptibility to far-right militia recruiting. And this becomes this huge political controversy uh, on Fox News. Janet Napolitano, DHS secretary, ends up having to uh, apologize for this DHS warning. They disband the unit that sort of looks at domestic terrorism. And what happens a couple of days later? Stuart Rhodes standing on the uh, on the lawn of uh, Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, again, that connection to the original Patriots founds the Oath Keepers. This group specifically targeting veterans of law enforcement and uh, and, and the military for sort of their own far right means. Oath Keepers and Stuart Rhodes become players at the Bundy Ranch standoff, the uh, the Sugar Pine Mine standoff, the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge standoff. Um, and sort of by January 6, 2021, have a you know long and troubling track record of standing up to the U.S. government by force and winning. And this becomes this really important part of this story. We spent an episode talking about these um, militia standoffs in, in um, these three militia standoffs in, in 2014, uh, 2015, and 2016, the, the Bundy Ranch, Sugar Pine Mine in Oregon, and then the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, um, after which the Bundys are acquitted at all of their trials, and they end up... Uh, you know, they're, they're the only people in American history who can claim that they launched armed uh, armed action against the federal government twice and came out uh, unscathed to the other side. And it makes them kind of 
folk heroes as with international terrorists, um, I think. Well, and uh, when when these trials, by the way, happen, and we're seeing it now, you'll see um, members or defendants often retreat to positions of, you know, we have strong ideological views, but we weren't there to commit violence and the like. Um, are Is there a whole, and maybe this is outside the purview of the series, but a whole sort of set of groups that, in fact, go and talk the talk, but when it, you know don't ever exactly drink the Kool-Aid and the Ruby Ridges and Rose of the World are the ones who decide, like McVeigh does in a moment of white-hot anger, I'm going to take these arms and find me some representatives of the U.S. government to harm. Uh, both are certainly true, but part of what you begin to see um, particularly in the last decade, and again, you know, you've lived this, you, you know, you, you've followed these stories too, um, is this sort of winking and nodding and joking where, you know, the Oath Keepers uh, or, you know, militia groups will, let, like the Boogaloo Boys, will say that they are um, not white supremacists and not white nationalists, but, you know, they just happen to show up at all the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, in full tactical gear, carrying loaded AR-15s to provide security for, um, you know, the property owners who, uh, you know, are around the scene. Um, you know, they just happen to set up sniper positions on the roofs of white-owned businesses around the... Um, uh, you know, around the protest zone. Um, so there's no real doubt about the ideology that underpins a lot of these groups. It's just they're able to create uh, very deliberately this sort of uh, muddle that makes it hard for, you know, journalists or activist groups to sort of call them what they are. Okay, and let's hone in specifically on race and anti-Semitism. Is, is it a sort of important flavor of many of the groups, or is it actually the, the kind of animating uh, philosophy that, you know, I'm thinking back to Charles Manson, I don't know where you'd put him in this whole group, but definitely the whole notion of a race war come, I mean, they have these phony cosmologies almost, and, 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 and myths, are they, um, you know, not, not, are they kind of hostile or completely um, racist and anti-Semitic yeah. to their, to their core? Um, mostly the latter. And that, to me, was one of the really amazing parts of the research and reporting for this series was understanding um, just what a, a just how continuous an ideological thread this is over 40 years. Um, and, and a big part of that is um, this book that you you surely know well, The Turner Diaries. Um, and uh, it, this uh, sort of manual um, written in the late 1970s by William Pierce, one of the um, founders of uh, the, the modern far right, a, a guy who left the American Nazi party because it was not extreme enough, if that gives you sort of some sense of his own ideology. Um, I really like these Nazis, but they're not quite extreme enough for me. So I'm going to go found in even they're further so sure right after through. All, right? Um, but the the, uh, the Turner Diaries is this like apocalyptic horror show of what a armed uprising by whites that provokes a class a, a race war in the United States um, could end up on looking like. Um, and it's written as a novel, but it is really a how-to manual for everyone who comes after it. And it becomes a key part of this ideology that's really known as the leaderless resistance, um, which is basically like the leaders of the far right talking openly about violence um, but keeping an arm's length from the people who are actually carrying out the violence. And in, in some ways, this is the organizing model that we sort of most closely associate with a group like ISIS um, that is, you know, inspiring action from afar through online radicalization, um, but carried is, out... Is, by, by the way, is much of the recruiting of these folks online rather than... Yes. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and, and, and in fact, one of the really fascinating threads when you pull back 40 years of this history is the extent to which the, the, the white power movement um, and the far right have actually been early pioneers yeah. in the internet. Um, that they, you know, in some ways understood the organizing power of the internet um, long before many others. And that um, we see and, that. And all up. So are there meetings as such? I, you know, I work for FedEx, but I'm a member of the Proud Boys. Thursday night, do we get together and read a chapter of the Turner Diaries, or it's just you know waiting for the command to come over the the my special uh, signal chat? Or so it, it's it, it's both. Um, you, you know, this is you know there are all sorts of these uh, patriot militia movements that grow up in the 1990s and then um, really reemerge. Uh, in much more extreme ways in the era of Barack Obama's presidency um, uh, that, you know, are some mix between sort of organized club and, you know, patriotic security force. Um, you know, we see some of these cells involved in things like the plot to kidnap the Michigan governor um, in the midst of COVID. Um, you know, we see some of these groups like the Proud Boys come together online, translate into offline action in the streets. Um, and, you know, these groups are in many ways uh, very explicitly anti-Semitic and, and, and white nationalist. I mean, in order to join you know, the Proud Boys. And I actually Boys, think the problems that, agree, that befall the country that have to be wiped out are, are caused by blacks and Jews as much, well, right? Uh, absolutely. And so, you know, to be a proud boy, the, the, yeah. the, the oath, there's an oath, a proud right? Boy, I mean, there's literally it, a, you know, like an eight year old. Well, actually, yes. Yeah. It, it, exactly. It, it, you know, you actually have to, yeah. you know, say that you are a Western chauvinist and that you believe that sort of Western white people are the ones to, uh, uh that sort of should rule the world. What makes Garrett, what makes their numbers sort of wax? and wane over the quit. So you're tracing this. I mean, it seems like one of the really valuable aspects of this series is it gives us some sense of what's always been blind to us, which is the activity in between the eruptions. Uh, so if you're in, you know, a, what, what goes on in the world that it becomes a selling point or becomes a point for people to say, ah, you know, I'm, um, I, I think I'm leaving this behind. Do you, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, it's a couple of different things. One is, um, you know, a key recruiting tactic for the far right, unfortunately, uh, are these government missteps along the way. I mean, these sort of bungled investigations um, into incidents like Ruby Ridge and Waco the radicalization of conservative talk radio and eventually Fox News becomes a really big part of this. Um, you know, we talk about uh, Caesar Sayoc, um, who uh, you sort of may remember in the just ahead of the midterms in 2018, sent uh, sent mail bombs to all, all manner of Democratic officials and political pundits and news organizations like CNN. And, uh, you know, he was almost entirely radicalized online um, through, you know, Fox News and Facebook groups and, you know, the, this sort of sense that he was going into battle for Donald Trump um, and that Donald Trump was calling him uh, to violence. Um, and, and we see this uh, unfold in, in, on January 6th as well, that, that um, Donald Trump has sort of spent all of his presidency, um, it, it, you know, sort of playing footsie with these militia groups. And, you know, in the wake of Charlottesville, his, you know, there were good people on both sides comment, his comment in the September 2020 debate to telling the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, which they took as a rallying cry. Um, and then, you know, there was the real sense going in, which, which we know from court testimony at this point, um, uh, heading into January 6th that these people sort of thought that they were showing up in Washington because the president was calling him there and would give them instructions. Um, um, remarkable. 
you know, uh, I this kind of eight uh, episode series is a kind of art form in itself, which you, as you know so well from your first season. I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of explain some of the choices uh, you made along the way. I there's a there's a particular project that we're sort of working on, and it's it's more challenging than it looks to actually bring it all together, especially here when the episodes are disparate. So. Give us give us a sense of how the you know work as a whole kind of the you know the overall architecture the decision you you made to balance the through line with the uh, individual uh, stories if you will yeah um you know there are a lot of different ways that you could approach this story um you know there there's one thread about this that's all about the ideology there's one part that's about the people. Um, you know, there's, you know, this very interesting thread through a lot of these stories about, you know, basically the disaffected, uh, you know, white working class male um, and his place in American society from the 1980s to the 2010s. And, you know, a big challenge, you know, in a podcast or um, a multimedia project like this is you don't have a lot of room to talk about a lot of characters. And so really, you know, in each episode, you know, we're really trying to narrow it down to a couple of storylines and, and really just, you know, maybe three or four voices and characters that you're, you're following and paying attention to. Um, and so for me, you know, the fun of this series um, was mixing names that people knew, you know, will know very well with some people that they don't really know very well. And so trying to give people the sense of a connected story over 40 years um, while giving them some surprises along the way about who ended up influencing whom. And it sounds like a lot of great archival uh, footage, by the way. Okay, so the so the first uh, episode debuts the the twelfth, I believe. How frequently thereafter, and where? So can, it'll be every find it, them? Uh, it'll be every Wednesday starting April twelfth. Uh, Long Shadows season two, Rise of the American Far Right, available wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. There you have it, and the uh, masterwork of historian journalist Garrett Graff. Garrett, thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Harry. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.